tried to abolish your soul. There's only one hope for your destiny, and that one hope is found when you're down on Ladies, let's stand together now as we take our Bibles and turn to the book of Acts, chapter 6. Acts, chapter 6. And in just a few weeks, I'm excited to begin two new series of messages. And we're going to begin a Sunday morning series entitled, Church, It's the Real Thing. I'm thankful that I'm an independent, fundamental, Bible-believing, Baptist, local church preacher. I like the church. I like Christians that hang around church. I like the Word of God being preached in church and singing like that in church. And and uh, one of the things I wrote on my list of 21 things that I wrote down was I'm glad that our kids grew up going to Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, missionary conference, uh, revival meeting. The church has been good for my family. I'm going to tell you that right now. And I love it. I'm going to preach a series on church. It's the real thing. What does a church believe and how does the church behave? And uh, what are the responsibilities of the church? What about the prayer of the church? And that's going to be on Sunday morning. And then on Sunday night, I'll be starting a new series entitled, Here We Stand. Here We Stand. As we come into this 25th year, just reinstating and, uh, and reiterating some of the very foundational truths that we began preaching and teaching 25 years ago. And it's going to be a great time on Sunday night here at Lancaster Baptist this fall as we just look at the, the things that are very important doctrinally and and practically as we serve the Lord at Lancaster Baptist Church. But tonight, we're going to come back to our theme for this year of 2010, and that theme is By His Spirit. We're going to learn tonight a little more about what it means to live and minister and serve uh, by His Spirit. And we're going to look at a man that we studied several years ago as we preached the book of Acts, uh, and this man, Stephen, was a part of that study. And so tonight, uh, follow with me as I read, uh, beginning in, in chapter 6, Acts chapter 6, beginning in verse number 1, and reading down through verse number 8. And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows 
were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and uh, Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multitude in Jerusalem, mul multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, we thank you tonight for the church, and we thank you for the glimpse that we'll take into the early New Testament church back in Jerusalem. And I pray tonight that you would teach all of us about your Holy Spirit and about what it means to live by your Spirit and to have your Spirit change us from the inside out. Please, Lord, tonight, do what only you can do and what only your spirit can do through your word. And Father, we thank you for what will take place, for the conviction that you will bring. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Not long ago, I was walking through a parking lot, and as I had parked my car, I noticed there was a fellow who was partly out of the spot next to me, had a beautiful 1957 Chevy. Uh, it was painted uh, beautifully. It had nice chrome. It, it uh, looked like he put a lot of time and money into it, and, and uh, yet he was kind of uh, sideways in the parking there, and he was on his telephone talking to a friend, and I overheard him saying to his friend, he said, you know, he said, I, I got it looking real good. I, I've got it parked over here at the store. Uh, he said, but I guess I underestimated how much gas these things take. He said, can you come over and bring me some gas so I can get it out of the parking lot? And I thought, you know, here's a fella that had a beautiful car, probably worth $30,000 or so. He put a lot, lot of money into it and maybe more. Uh, no doubt he knew everything you'd need to know about a car like that, restoration-wise and, and uh, what type of parts under the engine and he had uh, given a lot of thought to all of those things, but somehow along the way, he just didn't really know how much gas it would take. And because of that, here he was, stranded in the parking lot, going nowhere fast. And when I think about that story, and when I recall the picture of that car in my mind, I'm mindful of many churches in America tonight. Churches that look like a church, they sometimes even have a good doctrinal statement, uh, on paper at least, everything seems to be in place, and yet, like a car in a parking lot going nowhere, many churches tonight are sitting at a standstill, though they have all the resources of the Holy Spirit available to them, there is very little momentum, there is very little in the way of souls being saved, very little, if any, in the way of lives being changed, even as we sit here tonight. And with the Spirit of the living God at their disposal, these churches often experience none of the power of God. They conduct services but have few conversions. They have meetings but don't seem to really have meetings with God. And I believe tonight the priority of 2010 is exactly what we need in this hour, and that is to know more of the power and the person of the Holy Spirit of God and to explore the resources available to us by the Holy Spirit of God, and to bear the fruit in our family life and in our church life that can only come forth from the Word of God. Jesus said in John 16 and verse number 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. That verse always amazes me to think, that Jesus Christ, as he warns his disciples about the fact that he will be ascending up into heaven and soon he would leave their presence, he said to them, it is expedient for you that I go away and, 
And he said, because when I go away, the comforter is going to come to you. And, and the word expedient means it's conducive to your advantage. It means it's actually better for you, Jesus said, because when I go up to be with the Father, the Holy Spirit's going to come and he'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He'll indwell you. He'll always be with you. And I imagine those disciples saying, Lord, it can't be better for you to leave. Stay with us. Certainly that would have been my sentiment. Lord, uh, we want you to be with us. We want to see more miracles. We want to hear more teaching. But Jesus said to them, it's better for you. It's, it's something that is going to be great in your life. The Holy Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity, if you are a born-again Christian, He lives within you tonight. Your body is His temple. Your life is for His glory. And He wants to guide and direct your life. In fact, the New Testament gives us at least five commandments relative to our relationship with the Holy Spirit. And if you're taking notes, you might want to write some of these down or listen clearly because the Holy Spirit has a will and a desire tonight for your life and for mine. And the Bible speaks to the issue. The Bible says, for example, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 19, quench not the Spirit. Let's say that together. Quench not the Spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit of God, like the Word of God, is a convicting presence in our life. And uh, sometimes He convicts us to do something such as to pass out a gospel tract or to tell someone we apologize. Uh, sometimes He convicts us in the positive sense and sometimes He'll convict us to stay away from certain sin. And when the Holy Spirit's working on us or speaking within our hearts, the Bible says, quench not the Spirit. Don't, don't uh, be a discouraging Christian, but but be yielded to the Spirit. The Bible speaks of that. The Bible says in Ephesians 4 and verse 30, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Don't grieve the Spirit. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 5, we are to walk in the Spirit so that we would not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The Bible says in Jude and verse 20, we're to pray in the Spirit. And then, of course, in Ephesians 5 and verse 18, the Bible says, be not drunk with wine, word of success, but be filled with the Spirit. And you begin to get the idea that the Spirit of the living God desires to direct and guide and, and, yea, empower us so that we're not living our life, but Galatians 2.20, it's Christ's life through us by the power and direction of the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. Folks, in the Bible, we are never commanded in the Bible to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit indwells us immediately at the moment of our salvation. In the Bible, uh, we are never commanded one time to speak in tongues. Now, there are those who, either in fabricating form or uh, in some form of uh, uh, delusional activity or in some form of uh, perhaps mimicry, uh, are trying to say that this is a, a phenomenon that they're experiencing in their life. But, but, uh, but whether or not one would give credence to such activity, the fact still remains. We are never one single time in the Bible commanded to speak in tongues. We are never commanded to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. But we are commanded to be filled with the Spirit of God. To be emptied of ourselves, Romans 6, and to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Now, I think most everyone here tonight who's saved would say, all right, Pastor, I understand that the Spirit of God lives in me. By the way, how many of you thank God that He has convicted you and made you a better person? Don't ever, look at if the Holy Spirit's ever convicting you even during a message or uh, excuse me, even through Bible reading, or excuse me, maybe even your wife says something. How many of you hate it when your wife says something that's right and God uses it to tell you it was right? Now, ladies, I don't recommend that that's your you know, normal pattern. You know, there, there is a Holy Spirit in Him who can help Him, but sometimes God will use your spouse or even a little child or a circumstance to speak to you about something. Not in the form of direct revelation like Scripture, but to maybe convict you. It might be that your child would say, Daddy, I sure miss some time that we used to have. And the Holy Spirit can use that to say, you ought to take her and spend some time with her. Amen. Right? I think all of us understand that the Holy Spirit convicts and He touches our heart. And when He's trying to do that, don't fall prey to one of the subtle tricks of the devil on Christians in 2010. Don't call that kind of conviction a guilt trip. 
Now, there are people that try to lead by placing guilt trips on people. There are wives that try to get their husbands to do things by a guilt trip, and wives uh, and husbands the same way. I understand the whole guilt trip thing, but I'm just simply saying that when you're convicted by the Holy Spirit, that, my friend, is a precious gift. So don't quench that. And when something is being preached that it needs to be dealt with in your life, don't cast it off as merely a guilt trip when it may very well be that God is speaking to your heart in the matter. Well, tonight we come to the book of Acts and no, no greater story is told of the Holy Spirit's ministry than in the book of Acts. And we, we see the moving of the Holy Spirit. At the very beginning of the book, Acts 1-8, ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me. And we see the day of Pentecost and the signs and wonders uh, in Acts chapter 2. And, and, and we get a glimpse into the fact that God is changing lives by the thousands. And as lives are being changed and believers begin to gather, those believers were commonly known as the church. They were known as the called out assembly. And they were being called out by the Holy Spirit, and He was saving them, and they were gathering together. And when they began to gather in real large numbers at Jerusalem, uh, there were some problems that began to develop. And by the way, problems many times are just indicative of the fact that there's some growth happening, and problems oftentimes are just another opportunity for all of us to grow and for all of us to hear the Holy Spirit speak so that we can uh, do a better job at doing the work of God. And that is the case in Acts chapter 6 because the Bible says that as the number began to multiply, there was a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Uh, they had grown rapidly and uh, while there had been a distribution of care and, and visitation program and there had been a lot of love being shown, there was one segment of the church that wasn't feeling the love. They weren't uh, feeling the encouragement like they thought they should. And so they brought this problem to the pastors. And that was, that was fine. Uh, you, you, you probably would be surprised, hopefully not if you've been here a while, but uh, the pastoral staff, if there's a need, want to know about that need. And if there's someone that maybe is in the hospital and maybe there's some, some widow that has a need, uh, and our deacons want to know about these things so that those needs can be met uh, by the local body. And that's what happened here. They brought the need up and so the pastors uh, gathered together. They did not say we're above this, but they said it's not reason uh, that we should leave the Word of God. It's not reason that we should stop praying for the church uh, to serve tables. And so in verse 3 they said, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. And that sets the context for us tonight. The pastors of the church of Jerusalem said, Boy, we need some help. There's a lot of people that have needs. And, and these men uh, were considering the good, the better, the good, the better, and the best. And no doubt every one of them was willing uh, to serve tables and, and willing. I recall as I came here as the pastor, I mean, I was the janitor. I washed every toilet every Saturday night for months and months and months. Uh, I conducted the youth activities. Uh, painted, I painted every wall in that old building two or three times myself. Uh, and, and on and on the list went. But you know, amazingly, as the church grew, and as, as the greater responsibility of feeding a flock, uh, I don't feel that we ever get past doing those things. And uh, even today, I, I was doing some, uh, just emptying some trash and doing some things of this nature. But let me tell you, your prayer ought to be, God, give our staff and deacons wisdom to help pastor so he can stay in the Word of God in prayer. And that's Bible. That's, that's the Bible precedent. And so it was. They said, we need to get some help. And they said, we want you to choose some men who can come and help us with this need so we can stay in the ministry of the Word. And that brings us tonight to the man that we're going to study for the next few moments. The Bible says in verse number 5, And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. And I believe that what we're reading here is probably the, the account of the first deacons that were chosen in the church. And these were men uh, that were going to serve uh, the Lord Jesus in the church at Jerusalem. And tonight we're introduced to one of them, a man by the name of Stephen. Uh, he was a man that was called and chosen to be a servant, but we look at him tonight as a spirit-filled servant of God. And I want you to notice first and foremost tonight the ministry of a spirit-filled man. 
And I want you to get a glimpse into the heart and ministry of a man or woman that walks in the Spirit. Notice in verse 5 it says, And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen a man. What do the next three words say? Full of faith. Let's say it together. He was a man who had a full persuasion of the Lord. It was more than a positive attitude, but it certainly would have been a positive attitude. It was much deeper than that. Hebrews 11 and verse 6 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, 11.1, 1, and the evidence of things not seen. And here was a man who believed that God was able, and he was a man known for that type of a spirit. He served by faith. He lived by faith. And I believe tonight that we have seen what God can do at Lancaster Baptist Church in part because of the faith of His people, people who have testified and who have given and who have gone out soul winning, not knowing how in the world that's going to work and have signed up for soul winning. Why? By faith. Lord, I don't understand it, how you could use me, but by faith I want to be a part of this. And by faith we have learned how to serve and how to give. And so it was with this man Stephen. He was a man full of faith. But notice secondly it says he was a man full of the Holy Ghost. And we see that statement there in verse number 5, a man uh, full of the Holy Ghost. Now again, every Christian receives the Holy Spirit in their life at the moment of their salvation. But not every Christian is yielded to the Holy Spirit to the same extent. Uh, every Christian uh, po ha possesses the Holy Spirit. But not every Christian is possessed of the Holy Spirit. And, and this is a truth that must be pondered and that we must allow the Spirit of God to evaluate in our own lives. Romans 8 and verse 9 says, Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So you either have Christ and His Spirit or not. There's no middle ground. And yet if you have Christ as your Savior, then you have His Spirit in your life. Uh, when Terry and I were married nearly 30 years ago, as I stood there on that platform in San Jose, California, and as we repeated those vows, when I said those vows, at that moment I received the gift of a wonderful and godly wife. And when I prayed on April the 5th, 1972, to accept Jesus Christ as my Savior, when I said that prayer that night in San Jose, California, at that very moment I received the gift of the Holy Spirit of God in my life. Now I don't know how it was for you, to be frank, I did not know a lot about the doctrine of the Holy Spirit that night. I knew that He was working in my heart. I knew that I was a sinner. I knew that Jesus Christ could save me and that He shed His blood and He rose again. And I was saved that night. But I've got to tell you one of the greatest joys of growing in the Christian life has been to understand more fully what happened that night and to find uh, that night the Spirit of the living God took up residence in me. There is a new nature and I have through Him the ability to live a victorious Christian life. Now you may have the Holy Spirit tonight, but the question is, does He have all of you? Does He control your life? Are you filled with Him? And the word filled means to be led, controlled, and directed by Him. And the Bible speaks of this. And it is our mandate to be filled and directed by His Spirit. And let me say, church family, tonight, and really ponder this for a moment. <coughs> you and I have no obligation to the flesh tonight. Now, the world packages this. And don't, don't misunderstand me. We all need rest. I understand that. And, and it's needed. And uh, we need to take time. But the world so accentuates the flesh. And the world constantly uh, markets the idea, you deserve a break today. And the world constantly says, do this for yourself. You owe it to yourself. Do this for yourself. And again, there's, there's, a, there's a measure of wisdom. Jesus Christ himself went apart into a desert place often. And he would pray and he would rest. I'm not preaching against that, but I'm saying this tonight. The idea that I always owe myself something is contrary to the teaching of the Scripture. I really owe everything to the Spirit of the living God tonight. Turn in your Bible, if you would, for a moment to Romans chapter 8 and verse 12. Romans 8, 12. We'll come right back to Acts 6. Romans 8, 12 says this. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, 
Not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Now, someone says, but pastor, you don't understand. I, I have needs. Uh, I, 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 I deserve this. And, and yet what I do understand is that what starts off as something we think we deserve becomes something that we're enslaved to. And people begin to put money into it. Whether it's gambling at the casino, whether it's alcohol, whether it's uh, my wife doesn't meet my need and so some form of sin develops. Not a week goes by that this staff is not dealing with some, uh, some situation where an overindulgence in the flesh has created a massive problem that's generational in nature and it was because a Christian got duped into the idea that uh, we rationalize to the point that I deserve this. And, and folks, let's be honest about it tonight. We don't deserve anything except a one-way ticket to hell tonight. We are not, we don't owe ourselves. We owe the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this man, Stephen, was not a self-conscious, self-centered man. This man was not filled with self. This man was full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit of God. And consequently, he was full of the power of God. He was so emptied of self and, and so daily walking in the Spirit that God anointed him and used him in a, in a way that every one of us should say, Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. And, and it may not be to the same extent of the anointing, and it may not be to the same extent of the empowering, but it ought to be that every mother and father and college student and teenager here tonight would say, I don't know that I understand all about it, but I know that I need it. I want God's power in my life. Everybody ought to have a thirst for that. He was full of power. Notice what the Bible says in verse 8 about this deacon. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles in the people. And I'm not preaching tonight about the wonders and miracles. I'm not downplaying them. We're not preaching tonight that we need to copy the experiences of the transitional time here uh, in the church between the intertest the intertestament period. Uh, but, but let me just say this tonight. While we're not downplaying those miracles, they are indicative of the fact that there was a mighty power happening in the church and the greatest miracle of all was the fact that thousands of people were accepting Jesus as their Savior and those people loved each other so much that they were giving and helping and serving and doing all they could to be a blessing one to another and that was all because of the Holy Spirit at work in their lives. And they did receive that power that was promised to them in Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8. And I say to you tonight that if we are not growing in our understanding of the Spirit this year, if we're not walking in the Spirit, if we're not living in the Spirit, then we are living below our privileges as Christians because God has something wonderful in store for us and God wants to encourage our heart uh, and the devil wants to discourage our heart and God wants to uh, keep us from temptation and the devil wants us to fall into temptation and God wants to help us to utter the gospel and the devil wants us to never speak the gospel. And I'm saying tonight there's a power available in the person of the Holy Spirit of God uh, that, that guided the ministry of this man, Stephen, and we need that tonight. But notice, secondly, not only the ministry of the Spirit-filled man, but let's take a look at the message of the Spirit-filled man tonight. I really believe this. I really believe when somebody knows Jesus and they're really emptied of self and they're seeking to walk in a renewed sensitivity to the Holy Spirit, one of the things that is characteristic of those people is their vocabulary changes, their theme changes, and they talk about Jesus more. And I meet a lot of Christians when they first get saved, man, they are so glad to be forgiven, and they, they literally, uh, I mean, they just want to talk to everybody about Jesus Christ. But then we can get into our comfort zone. Let's take a look at Stephen's life. Here was a man whose message was different. I want you to see in verse 5, it says, And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of, take note of this phrase, full of, what does it say next? I think that's a clue for us. He was a man full of faith, all right? Now, now the question would be, where did that come from? 
Why are some people strong and some people weak? This is simple. Some people are strong because they eat. Somebody saying, man, I ought to be really strong. I'm not talking about food here. <laughs> Come on now, jump to the spiritual application. So he was full of faith. Why? Because Romans 10, 17, faith cometh by and hearing by the... And so whatever his message was, you can guarantee yourself that it was going to be a Bible-based message that whatever you're filled up with is what's going to come out. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So someone says, I think you're a dirty, rotten bum. And then they say, I didn't really mean to say that. You're like, well, I'm going to forgive you, but I'm kind of curious about maybe it might have been in there because it sure came out of there. And when you've had your devotions, and when you're listening to preaching, and when you're reading the Word of God, some of that's going to come out, folks, and, and it's going to mean that, that, uh, that you are different in your speech because you have been filling up with the Word of God. The Holy Spirit has been reinforcing what the Word of God uh, means and how it applies to your life. And in fact, this man, Stephen, was so filled with it. I want you to just read this little portion with me in verse 9. It says, Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and the Cyrenians and Alexandrians and of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputed with Stephen and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake here is a synagogue in Jerusalem uh, that was for those of the dispersion who came to gather uh, at these uh, special holy times and Stephen uh, was no doubt in the spirit of the early church known as a witness and a preacher and someone who proclaimed Jesus Christ and, and these of this particular synagogue began to argue with him. They would have been the apologists of their day. They would have been the antagonists of their day uh, for their false teaching. And, and here they are arguing against Stephen as he has been preaching Jesus Christ. And the Bible gives us a glimpse into the fact that he was filled with the word because it says, they were not able, verse 10, to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. How many of you would like that measure of grace in your life? Lord, I want to have the right words to say, and I want to say it in the right spirit. By the way, I know a lot of fundamentalist friends of mine who know the right words to say, but because they're not filled with the Spirit. They might be filled with the Word, but because they're not filled with the Spirit, they don't always say it in the right way. And sometimes the way you say it is as important as what you're saying. They were not able to resist the wisdom, that's the word of God, and they were not able to resist the spirit. And I have seen men of God, greatly used of God, and I have seen from Phil Donahue to uh, Larry King to the rest of the reprobates on television just angrily pointing their finger into the face of certain men of God, and the response has been a proper response, a gauge response, a spiritual response, and it's sure hard to argue against someone who's got that spirit. By the way, how many of you say, I want to have that spirit when I witness? I know there's times when we need, to, uh, we need to compel with fear and be bold. But Stephen had the feeling of the spirit to know what to be and how and when. And, and he was a man who preached the word of God. And then not only was he filled with the word, but notice his message furthermore was fervent when the opposition picked up. It, it was a fervent message. It was something that was uh, real in his heart. And the Bible tells us of this fervency uh, in these verses 9, 10, and 11. And how he was faithful to stand and speak the word of God, even in the midst of spiritual opposition. And I want you to see what happens to him in verse 11. It says, Then they suborned men, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. If you're taking notes tonight, the word suborn means they hired men. Now get this in your mind very quickly. They hated this on-fire deacon so much that they hired people to tell lies about him. And they hired these people to say that he was a blasphemer. And they stirred up the people, verse 12, and the elders and the scribes, and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council. And they set up, what do the next two words say? What kind of witnesses? They set up false witnesses against Stephen. 
And, uh, and they began to set up opposition and accusing Stephen. And as they stirred up the people, they were doing everything they could to discourage this man of God. And let me tell you, men, if you intend to be a man of God who reads the Word of God tomorrow and walks in the Spirit of God tomorrow where you work, there's going to be somebody that's not going to be happy about the fact you gave him a track, you prayed for your lunch, you put something up on the bulletin board. Look, at, I'm not trying to discourage you tonight, but this idea that you can be a cool Joe Christian and have a little rap session at church on Sunday and live however you want to live on Monday and, and, and that's what Christianity is that is not Bible Christianity there are times when you take your stand for God and it's gonna ruffle some feathers now I'm not telling you you know go to the president of your company tomorrow and say hey reprobate you're on your way to hell I'm not telling you to say that okay don't walk out of here and you know just say oh good a pastor said to get somebody mad at me I'm not telling you to try and do that some of you can do it without trying, it's a gift. <laughs> but what I am saying is that if you have a spirit-filled life and you speak about Jesus, not everybody's real happy about that. And yet, he was fervent when the opposition came. Look right here, as we enter this soul-winning season. Somebody may have just slammed a door on you last year. Somebody may have hurt one or more of your feelings. Somebody maybe discouraged you a bit, but I just want to remind you that a spirit-filled Christian who's dead to self needs to get back up and keep on going out and telling others. Because it's not about how we feel. It's about being obedient to Him. His message was filled with the Word of God. It was a fervent message. Notice thirdly, His message focused on Christ. Now I want you to turn to chapter 7, and in a moment we'll look at more of this. But look at chapter 7 and see here what the Bible says in verse number 51. Here is his message to the Sanhedrin. As we'll see in a moment, by this time, there has been an agitation building towards this deacon. And they're gathering around. They're tired of his fervency. They're tired of his preaching about this Jesus. And so he begins to preach to them, and he says... Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. Now again, I don't recommend that for your morning thought with your employees tomorrow, okay? But there were reasons for these words. These were words that cut right to their Jewish hearts. These were words that reminded them that they had denied Jesus Christ as the Messiah. He spoke to the issue of his day. And he said, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the, notice the words here, just one. And as the text develops, this is all about the just one. This is all about Jesus Christ. It wasn't about Stephen. It wasn't about the Baptist church at Jerusalem. This was all about Jesus Christ. And a spirit-filled man will always exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John 16, 14, He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. You see, a person who's filled with the Holy Spirit will exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. We had a lady come to our church many years ago. Some of you knew her. This is Juanita Bishop. Juanita came into the church. She visited a couple times. And one Sunday after church, on a Sunday afternoon, she said, Pastor Chapel, can I speak to you? I said, yes, ma'am. I think Juanita might have been in her late 60s by that time. She said, I've been attending another church. She said, in fact, I've been attending there for a long time. She said, it's a Baptist church. It's a different denomination. She said, our church has been changing a lot lately. She said, we're having fewer and fewer services. She said, they even changed the name from Baptist. They just called it, I think they called it The Rock. And she said, I don't mind a new chorus here and there, but she said, I, we never sing a song that I even know. And she had helped to buy the hymn book. She was personally involved and burdened about it. She had every right to be. She said, we have kind of a rock and roll band. And, and she said, all of that was troubling me. She said, she, she said I love the people there. And she said, but, but the thing that troubles me the most, and this is what she said. She said, what troubles me the most is that I like to bring my friends knowing that the preacher will give an altar call so they can get saved. And she said, when they stop giving the altar call, 
I just felt like I couldn't do that anymore. And then she said to me, she said, I was wondering, would you ever consider, and this is how she said it, having an old Southern Baptist woman like me come and be a member of your church? I said, well, Juanita, if God wants you to come, we'd be honored to have you come and be a part of our church. She said, honestly, I don't feel like I'm leaving my church. I feel like they left me. She was trying not to be critical. I said, well, you pray about it if you want to come. So sure enough, she came. And I mean, she got involved immediately. She had a heart for souls. I remember she went up to Brother Fursal one time at Soul Winning. She said, don't give me just one map. I'm retired. Give me two maps so I can knock on some extra doors. <laughs> she would go out faithfully. She began to give me a list of people to pray for, for, for her family, her kids, her grandkids, and so forth. And, uh, uh, and, and I remember when I met her, first, her grandson, Jeff. Jeff and Marilee came in. They came in. Uh, to talk about getting married. And here at Lancaster Baptist Church, we have premarital counseling. It's usually conducted by Brother Schmidt or Brother Getch or Brother Houck, those three. Sometimes I might do some, but normally one of those three. And so way back then when I was doing most of it, I had the first session and session number one is always how to get saved. You don't want to get married to someone who's not saved and you need the Lord in your marriage. So we sat down with her grandson, Jeff, and his fiancee, Marilee, and after a little while, they prayed and accepted Christ as their Savior. Oh, Juanita was tickled about that. I mean, she was so happy about that. Jeff and Marilee, they got excited. They started coming to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. They started going out soul winning, so forth. Boy, they were excited about it. And I remember, oh, a few months later, one of the secretaries called and said, there's a lady here to see you named Linda Bishop. And said, uh, she's one of the bishop family, she likes you. And I thought, well, Juanita's prayers are being answered again. And uh, here's another one of the bishops going to come and get saved. Praise the Lord. So I said, have her come right on up. And uh, Miss Verso brought her there. And uh, I said, how can I help you? And, and Linda, she walked in. And she walked up to my desk. And she put her hand on my desk like this. And she said, what kind of a cult are you running around here? <laughs> I'd never had that question posed directly like that before. <laughs> I've had some dear friends say similar things uh, without me being present, but never just present like that. And I remember saying, uh, Baptist one? <laughs> I know what to say. She said, I don't know what you're doing around here, but my son Jeff came here and he's coming to this church on Sunday mornings and Sunday nights. He's coming to this church on Wednesday nights. He said, he's even going out soul hunting. And they, I mean, they had gotten whole hog involved, so forth. I didn't really know what to say. I'd never dealt with that before. And I said, well, I said, ma'am, I'll tell you, I, I don't really know what to tell you, but I'll tell you this. If I thought my kids were involved in something dangerous like this, I mean, if I was really worried about them, I would come and check it out myself. <laughs> I said, you, you really, you need to investigate it. You know, get some, you know, awareness group or something. Come on in, check it out. She said, that's exactly what I'm going to do. We did not close in prayer. We did not even say goodbye. That was just, that was that. And sure enough, that next Sunday, uh, Brother Rick and Linda sat right over here about in the fifth row. I didn't even get through the whole sermon. I could, I could see Rick's quivering lips from the pulpit. And, uh, and then I saw the tears coming down. And when we stood, he started walking. I remember he turned and looked at Linda and she started crying. And uh, they came and accepted Christ as their Savior. There's a little old Southern Baptist lady in the back. Happy. Happy. Several others were saved. I remember one day coming back from preaching somewhere, and I landed on, uh, at the L.A. airport around noon on a Wednesday. And I remember Mrs. Furso called on the phone, and she said, Pastor, uh, the family's over with Juanita. She'd been ill. She'd been battling cancer. Said, uh, they said you might want to come by and see her. I said, tell them I'll come. And so I swung by from the airport and went right to the house. When I walked in, Brother Rick met me. He said, Pastor, now, Mom's not able to talk. We don't know if it's the morphine or she's maybe in a coma. But she's not able to talk right now. I said, well, that's all right, Brother Rick. I said, I'll talk to her. And I walked in and I said, Juanita's pastor. Just want you to know we love you. We're praying for you. 
Just came by to see you. I've got about half of that out or so, and Juanita, all of a sudden, she'd been laying in her bed. She jumped like, she said, Pastor, this is Grace, my nurse. She needs to know how to get saved. She lay back down like this. <laughs> and I know some people say, well, you know, you know, the medicine does these things, you know. <laughs> I mean, that's like people who think, you know, some kind of a, you know, shortage of rain is why the Red Sea parted. You know, everyone's got a reason for everything. Let me tell you, friend, I've been at the bedside of the dying unsaved, and I've been at the bedside of the dying saved, and I will tell you what the difference was. It was the Holy Spirit of God. You see, when someone is filled with the Spirit and they're filled with the Word of God, it's going to come out from them that they want others to know about Jesus Christ. And even though Stephen was facing death, even though he would soon become the first martyr of the Christian church, even though all of that was in the works, still he spoke about the just one, uh, Jesus Christ. Why? Because he was so great and powerful in oratory? No, because there was someone in him that was giving him power and strength, and that was the Holy Spirit of God. He was focused on Christ. But I want you to see tonight, not only the ministry of this man full of faith and power, not only the message of this man full of the word and focusing on Christ, but I want you to see finally tonight the manner of a spirit-filled man. The manner of a spirit-filled man. The Lancaster Baptist Church, as some would say, is old school. And that's okay. I was Baptist born and Baptist bred, and when I die, I'll be Baptist dead. I don't apologize for being an old-fashioned Baptist. I don't even apologize for being a fundamentalist. I don't apologize for our heritage. In fact, I'm very thankful for men like Dr. Hudson who influenced my life. And there are many motivators in my life, but certainly one is that I want to be a faithful witness and a faithful one in carrying the torch of those who've gone before us. But one of the things that I've tried to live, and I've tried to preach, and I think We've all tried to grow in this area as a, as a church family. Is that the manner in which we do the ministry must be a manner that is balanced in Christ likeness. And perhaps sometimes people have not always sensed that in every church as they should. Perhaps not here all the time. But our goal would be that every visitor would know. The Spirit of God is at work there, and I'm loved there. And I think of the Lord Jesus Christ when I think of this manner of the Spirit-filled person. John 1, 14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory as of the only begotten of the Father, and then these words, full of grace and truth. Would you say that with me? Full of an extreme position on grace would become what might be called antinomianism or against the law. I have met Christians who are antinomian in their doctrine and in their practice and it becomes a, a form of license to live however they want to live. They view grace as, I can party if I want, don't you be a legalistic joy killer, I'm going to do what I want, I'm under grace. But I must remind those friends of mine who have come under that persuasion, the Word of God is very clear. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? What's the answer? God forbid. There's another extreme on the other side, uh, an extreme in emphasizing truth to the point that a pharisaical, judgmental spirit will develop in which one believes he's so much better than someone else who maybe just hasn't grown to that point and instead of emphasizing the centrality of Christ and instead of preaching the whole counsel of God, they'll find the one or two things they do a little better. Mind you, they have major other issues they've got to work on. But they'll find the one or two other little things that they do better. And because they do that one better or that two things better, then they're better than everyone else. And that, my friends, becomes a legalistic spirit. And so we look not to the right, we look not to the left, but we look to the Lord. And when we do, we find that He was full of grace and truth. He had the divine balance. He was fully God. He was holy God. 
and yet he was love as God, and he showed grace like this world has never known. In fact, when the Sadducees and Pharisees threw down in front of him a woman who had been caught in the very act of adultery, he knelt down and wrote into the sand what some believe was the Ten Commandments. And then he looked up at those judgmental men, and he said, The one of you that is without sin, let him cast the first stone. And one by one, those Pharisees turned around and walked out. And then he did look at the woman and he said, go and sin no more. He didn't condone her sin, but he didn't condemn her either. May this always be a church that stands for truth and preaches against sin and stays in the old-fashioned way. But may it always be a church where every sinner in Lancaster knows, if I need some help, if I need to know about God, I know I can find out over there at Lancaster Baptist Church. Jesus was full of grace and truth. In Luke 4 and verse 1, and Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Now I'm just simply saying tonight, if Jesus was led of the Spirit, and if Jesus was full of grace and truth, how much more do we need to be led of the Spirit? Let's see. Now let's look at this manner of the Spirit-filled man. First I want you to see that he was bold in his preaching. This man had a Holy Spirit-given boldness. Notice, if you would now, back in chapter 7 and verse 51, he says, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. You're starting to catch the glimpse that he might have been a strong preacher. Notice in verse number 52, Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? Here we begin to see he's building a case. Here we see his boldness in preaching. Here we see a man who was willing to stand and say it like it really was. And that boldness again came from the Spirit. And that's why I say you might feel timid about witnessing. That's why we need the fullness of the Holy Spirit, uh, the boldness of the Holy Spirit to speak out for Jesus Christ. But notice not only was he bold in his preaching, but secondly, he was graceful under pressure. Remember back there in chapter 6 when they hired people to lie about him? Remember back there in chapter 6 when they were arguing and saying, you're a blasphemer and you're not telling the truth about Moses? Let's go back to that chapter just for a minute. Notice what it says in verse 15. And all that sat in the council looking steadfastly on him saw his face as it had been the face of, and what? Angel. They're saying, you're a liar. You're a blasphemer. You're a wicked man. They're doing everything they can to rile the man up. And then they just look at him. And they did not see hate. And they did not see horror. They saw heaven. Let me just tell you something about being a Christian. If you're going to live for the Lord, someone's going to try to push your button. Yeah. They'll tell a lie about you. They'll gossip about you. They'll say something unkind about you. And they might say a whole bunch of stuff. And they might just say it and say it and say it and then go, how about that? And here's the question, when they do, what are they going to see? Are they going to see you getting even? Are they going to see you exploding like a nuclear bomb? Are they going to see hate? Or are they going to see the Lord in your life? full of grace and truth. The Bible says this man focused on the truth. And the wonder of Stephen was that he had such grace under pressure. And here this man, though the pressure was building, stayed faithful. And notice in chapter 7 as we close tonight, notice the faithfulness of Stephen. The Bible says in verse 57, Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Here's a man in his dying moment. The Spirit of God was making the difference. 
In his dying moment, as the stones were coming against his skull and into his torso, and as a pool of blood began to form round about him, as he no doubt fell under the heavy load of the rocks that were coming against him, here's a man, even in that moment, who's saying, Lord, don't lay this to their charge, Lord. I submit to you that I do not know that I could say that in that moment without the Lord. And someone says, but pastor, you don't realize how mean someone's been, or you just don't understand how unfair my spouse is, or you don't understand. And I'm not trying to say your problems are small. I'm trying to say to you tonight, your God is big, and the Holy Spirit is powerful tonight. And if a Susanna Winkler, who was going through a tough time in her marriage as a younger married woman, and others thought you ought to just divorce him, and she said, but he's a good man. She stayed in her marriage until that man got saved, and she stayed with him for 58 years. I think there might be someone else tonight who could say, God, with your grace and your power, I'm going to stick with it. You say, but I tried to witness, and they weren't kind. Have you ever been stoned? I don't know what's coming in America. I mean, I'm praying for revival. Amen? But I don't know what's coming in America. I don't know what laws could be passed. I don't know what changes could come to to try to thwart the gospel message. But sometimes I wonder, what's it going to take to get some Christians to stop witnessing? Maybe that. Maybe just a little bit of nothing. Stephen, in his dying moment, said, Lord, forgive them. And I know, someone says, well, pastor, you know, I'm trying to live this spiritual life, but I don't know that it really makes a difference. I don't know that God's really using my life. Now listen carefully. Perhaps Stephen may have said that same thing as he died. He may have wondered as his life was slipping away. And none of us ever really know, but I can tell you this, if you'll read to the next chapter of the book of Acts, you're going to find the Bible describes in chapters 8 and 9 that that day as Stephen was being stoned, there was some, someone standing and watching this. There was someone that was watching over the process. He, he was Saul of Tarsus. He was schooled in the school of Gamaliel. He was one of those guys. I mean, uh, Pharisee, he was, he was a zealous for the law. He knew exactly what was going on. And he was very glad that Stephen was being stoned. And he thought, Stephen deserves exactly what he's getting. Why? How dare him refer to us as uncircumcised in heart? And he was there watching the whole thing. But, but then we read on a few verses later and we find that This same Saul of Tarsus was traveling on the road to Damascus. And as he was leaving northward out of Jerusalem, the Bible tells us that a light shone down from heaven. And sometimes people say, well, you know, I've never had a road to Damascus experience. Excuse me. It doesn't have to be with light from heaven. But if you've been saved, you're going to know when you got saved. And he had a road to Damascus experience and the light of heaven shone round about him and the voice of Jesus said to him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Those pricks, those goads that a farmer would prick into the back of an oxen trying to get the oxen to move, that was not what Jesus spoke about. What Saul was experiencing was what I spoke to you about at the beginning of the message. He was experiencing that pricking, that convicting of the Holy Spirit of God. And Jesus was saying, hey, don't quench it. Don't fight it. It's hard for you to kick against those pricks that you're feeling. And the pricks were coming into his heart because he had seen a man die whose name was Stephen. And he saw this man not angry and not crying out in anger and not crying out in bitterness, but he saw the man as the rocks were coming and the blood was flowing. He saw a man saying, Lord, don't uh, put this to their charge. And that day mighty Saul saw this little Christian man crumpled up in a pile of rocks and that man had what he didn't have. And as he rode on the way to Damascus, the spirit of the living God was saying, you need what that man has. And so Paul did what every saved man does. He said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? 
Saul became Paul, and the rest is history. Is there anybody on this planet that would ever say, I want what that guy has about you? Is there anybody on this planet that would ever say, I don't know what that lady has, but I, I need that? Because, friend, if that's ever said about you or me, it's only because of the Holy Spirit doing something beautiful in our lives. It's not because of us. It's all because of the Holy Spirit. 1 John 4, 4 sums it up. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. By his Spirit. That's how ministry happens. By his Spirit. That's how Stephen died. By his Spirit. That's how Paul lived. And by his Spirit. That's how we can live in God's power this week. Shall we stand together? Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this time together tonight in your house. I just pray right now, Lord, that if there is anyone here without Christ as their Savior, that they would come and trust you tonight. And I pray that every born-again Christian would have, in this very moment, a yieldedness and obedience. That we would have a hatred for sin. Anything, Lord, that would quench your spirit, anything that would hinder your power, I pray you'd bring it to our minds right now. If there's animosity, if there's sin of any kind, Lord, please, may you show it to us and may we willingly confess and repent of that. And then may we seek your Spirit's full leadership. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. How many are here tonight You say, it would be foolish of me to ask God to fill me with his Spirit because God and I both know that at this particular moment, there is some sin in my life that needs to be emptied out. According to Romans chapter 6, I've got to die to that. And Pastor, I want you to pray with me first that I would be honest with God. I need to repent of some things tonight. Pray for me. Would you lift your hand tonight? Anyone like that? All right. Thank you for your honesty. Now, for those that lifted their hands and for those that did not, who would say, Pastor Chapel, God has spoken to my heart. I need to live the way Stephen lived. I want my ministry to be a ministry with his power, my message to be a Christ-centered message. I want my manner to be truth but grace. I want my life to be balanced. And God spoke to my heart that I need to be a spirit-filled man, woman, teenager. God spoke to me about it. Pastor, pray with me. Would you lift your hand tonight all over this auditorium? God bless you. I'm going to ask the piano to begin playing. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. And as the piano plays, if you lifted your hand tonight, that is a very serious matter. I want to encourage you tonight to come and come before the Lord. Those of you that said, I've got some sin I need to repent of, don't stand there and do nothing with that. Take a moment right now and say, Lord, I want you to have your way in my life. I want to lay aside these thoughts, this sin. I want to ask you, Lord, to guide me and direct me this week. I want my life to be by your spirit tonight. By your spirit. If you're here without Jesus as your savior, and tonight you'd like to come and ask what it means to be a Christian, there's folks right here at the front that would like to talk with you about how you can be born again by the spirit of God, through the word of God. And you come, if you have another need tonight, there's another decision you need to make, we'll wait for you. Let God have his way in your heart, in your life. Now, while these are here at the front, I want to have a word of prayer with them and with all of us just now. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray tonight that you would forgive us for those days when we walk in our flesh and we don't listen, we don't rely upon you, we don't follow your spirit as we should. I pray for these tonight especially who are praying. I pray, God, that you would put within their hearts an awareness of your presence, that you would guide and direct them and that there would be an obedience and a joyful, fruitful walk. May it be for souls, Lord, and may it be for 
righteous living. And may it ultimately be for your glory. Help us to be a church that walks by your spirit. Help us to have men like Stephen and women like this for your glory. Our heads are bowed still and you just pray as long as you need to. In a moment we'll conclude our service, but let's do God's will.